Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we are focused on giving hope and strength to the entire military community. Whether you're a veteran, active duty, guard, reserve, or a family member, this podcast will share inspirational stories and resources that are useful to you. I'm your host, Scott Delusio, and now let's get on with the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Drive On Podcast. Today, my guest is David Richards. David spent his early childhood as a military brat in various parts of the United States and a few years in Japan. Later, he followed in his dad's footsteps and joined the Marine Corps. And in this episode, we're going to talk about how David handled his transition out of the Marine Corps and realized that even seemingly impossible dreams can come true as he was transitioning out. So without further ado, welcome to the show, David. I'm glad to have you on. Scott, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. I was thinking back because I've been promoting my last book for a couple of years now, and this may be the first veteran focused podcast I've done. So I'm really honored and excited to speak with you. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And we love having veterans on to share their stories. Really the heart of it is, you know, sharing your story, tell the things that you've gone through and what you've experienced and how you made things right. You know, like after getting out of the military, a lot of times, a lot of guys and women are coming out and they're just trying to make sense of the world because it's totally different coming out of the military oh, yeah. to, into the civilian world. Just a little. And yeah, it is. And when you come out, it's like a whole new world. And so hearing stories from people like yourself and other veterans who've been there, done that and gone through stuff, it just makes it so much more relatable and lets people know that, Hey, so this guy did it, that, that gal did it, you know, whoever it was, they did it. And I could do it too. That gives some hope to people. So I'm hoping that we can kind of dig into your story a little bit and talk about where you were, where you are now and how you got there. So I guess let's start off. Just tell us a little bit more about yourself, your background and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So as you mentioned at the onset, I grew up in the military. So I was born into a military family. I was born at Fort Delaware, Virginia. If anybody is familiar with the, that post there, it was strange because you don't know what life is supposed to be like. I mean, you, you know, your life. And so growing up as a military dependent, I knew we moved a lot. As I was saying, before we got on air, we lived for four years off base. And that was a dramatically different experience than living on base. But living on base and moving, it was part of my challenge growing up was I, I hated losing my friendships. And this was obviously well before the internet, well before you could FaceTime one another and say, Hey, I miss you and all this other stuff. And it was like, so I grew up with this weird, in one sense, I was really creative. We spent three years in Japan when I was in fifth, sixth and seventh grade. That was hugely impressionable for me. So that was the late seventies, early eighties, which I know could be ancient history for some people, but, but it was fascinating being exposed to Eastern culture and Eastern philosophy and also being a foreigner on foreign soil. Like you knew you were in the minority and you were right. the one who kind of didn't belong in this land, so to speak, which was impactful. It really, you know, gave me a huge appreciation for why the Marines had a base on Okinawa in the first place, but also the fact that Japan's culture was so fantastically different and unique from American culture. Came back to the States, I went to Camp Lejeune here on the coast of North Carolina and uh, very different. Now suddenly the mindset shifted, the culture shifted. It was high school popularity in the eighties and it was kind of like, okay, what does that mean? But I realized that such a small fraction of my classmates had the experience of living overseas at that point. I mean, they just didn't. So that was a big change. So I was really creative in English writing, had a, some poetry that won contests, short story that won national recognition. And that's kind of what I wanted to do. But growing up at a military base, you just don't appreciate how big the world is, even when you travel overseas and you just don't appreciate what life is like on the other side of the fence. And that for me was just this big unknown. And so when it came time to college, I only applied to two places. I applied to Penn State and UNC. Penn State, because that was where uh, my dad declared residency for our statehood. So we paid taxes in Pennsylvania and UNC just because Michael Jordan went there. And I thought it was cool. It was like three hours up the road from Cape Lejeune. But uh, went to Penn State, majored in English, ROTC, not again, not knowing what to do and how to make it my, as a writer, I just said, I'll follow in my dad's footsteps, follow my brother's footsteps joined the Marines, did that for 15 years. And then I was kind of like, I don't, I, I was literally 
following in my dad's footsteps. I was like, I will go in until they tell me to get out and do all this and I'll retire. And I had, I had surgery in my neck. I had a tumor in my neck and around 2005, that's kind of made me think like, what am I doing? Like, what am I really? I, I'm so, as much as I'm terrified of what's it on the other side of the fence, because I've never been a civilian, never in my entire life. And I never will, you know, I never really will be, but what is on the other side of that fence? So I made the decision to get out, immediately fell in love with yoga, was not part of my game plan, not part of my roadmap. And I didn't realize how much I needed that, but it was just such a big shift for me. And then was working corporate America. And then kind of got to the point where I got back into writing and started working on my books. I find it very interesting how you just said that you had never been a civilian throughout that whole experience. Right. And yeah. obviously you weren't enlisted, you weren't an officer or anything right, right. while you were in That's elementary cool. school or anything like that, but you were living the military lifestyle. You're living yeah. on a military base. You, you kind of just grew up around the military and I get that. Like, it makes sense the way you said that, like, you've never been a civilian. You'd never really the suburbs or whatever, and just yeah. hang out with the friends that you've had growing up all your life. It was that military life where you're moving every few years and you're making new friends and everything. And that's very similar to the experience of a lot of active duty service members where they're moving from one place to another. And I never really thought about it like that. And the area that I live in now, we live right near an air force base. And so there's a lot of military families in our neighborhood that we've gotten to know over the years. They've come and gone because they've moved from one place to another. Funny enough, some of them have actually moved to Japan at, with young kids. And so I started thinking about them and their kids and what that experience must have been like for them. Obviously now, nowadays they have the internet and they can keep in touch with, yep. with, you know, friends and, and things like that, but, but still going over to completely different culture where you probably don't speak the language, probably can't read the street signs and the things like that, right? The food, the culture, the everything is just totally different over there. And you know, what's that like for a kid to be just plucked out of yeah America and dropped into Japan? Like in, in that mindset of, I've never been a civilian. It just, it kind of clicked with me and I was like, wow, that, that I never thought about it that way. Yeah. Well, I, I, so it's, it's funny you said, because I've been I was looking at a review my manuscript for my next book last night. And there's a part where I talk about when we were kids. And I mean, like when I was five or six, we used to play war. Like that was, it was just war. And like you had guns. Well, so like everyone on our street had plastic machine guns that made this like squirky, you know, that noise or whatever. My brother and I had the rifle wooden frames of M1 Garands that the Marine Corps had gotten rid of. So like, like who has that? Like we were literally going around with M1s that the Marines had used World War II and gotten rid of finally after Vietnam. And my brother and I were like going around, those were our guns. Like it was just surreal. So now when we moved to Okinawa, it was, I mean, even just the experience of the kid, I remember we flew from. I want to say we drove across country, we sold our car in Los Angeles and then took a plane from LAX to Alaska. And certainly that was the longest flight I'd ever been on at nine years old. And you cross the international date line at some point and you're like, okay, now suddenly yesterday, it was like Sunday and now it's Monday. So we're like fast forward into the future somehow. And then landing in Okinawa, we landed in July. 10 30 at night at Naha International Airport, and literally the 50 yards it took to walk from the plane to the terminal, you're drenched in sweat. And so you're like, okay, interesting. And then we're driving to our hotel, and the habu is one of the most poisonous snakes in the world, and it's on Okinawa. It's called the habu. And so we're driving to our hotel, and we see some kids playing in the street with this giant snake. You're like, okay, but Okinawa was fascinating. I mean, it's the island is not tremendously big, and there are certainly points on the island where you can be at a peak and look both on both sides of the island to see the water. And so being in kind of this tropical paradise was fascinating. Like it was on base was so cool because I had uh, two really good friends who were, they were a year younger than me, but we had so many things in common and we lived right next to each other. So it was fantastic. And then strangely enough, we were the only three that I ever remember with any regular that would go off base. And there was 
it wasn't a fence that separated the on base from the base from off base. It was more like a cement, but an like an ornamented cement barrier kind of, and it had holes in it. And so like it had these little squares, grid squares almost. And one of the grid squares right by our house had been popped out. So we would sneak through that or carve or climb over the barbed wire to go off base. Like, so really here you see 10 to 11 year old kids like navigating with ease the guard between off and off base. But, and so we would just like the candy, like you're right. I mean, it smelled different. It looked different. I mean, certainly Okinawa then, you know, was not well affluent. It wasn't like, you know, I mean, some of the places we'd walk by were these shanties and it was like corrugated aluminum houses. I mean, it was really thin stuff, but the, you could, you know, smell the food there. You could also smell, they had the, uh, the latrine, like the, they had what was called benjo ditches, which is where like the, basically the sewer is, but it's aerated. So you can smell it. So it's not necessarily oh, okay. super pleasant, but it was, I mean, it was just, everything was so different. Everybody, obviously Okinawans look completely different than Americans and they're everywhere. Very few blondes, you know, you saw people who had bleached their hair, you could tell kind of, but all the school kids wore uniforms. The most of the mama sons you saw still wore like the traditional kind of older kimono, but it was just, it was so different. And that was the cool thing was I remember, you know, as a kid, you're focused on like toys. And so we'd go see like Japanese toys and they were so much more intricate and detailed. It made me pre like. Like American, back in the time, it was like, I remember we had action figures like G.I. Joe, which was probably like a foot tall, or you'd have a little Superman, your Batman things, but they're all really rigid. And in Okinawa, they're like very detailed and intricate and they're small. And so it was like fascinating. And, you know, we used it as a stepping stone. My dad was very, having been in Vietnam, I think my dad wanted at least to expose us to the Orient to a certain extent. So. Between the three years of Japan, we went to South Korea twice. We went to the Philippines twice or three times. And it was fascinating because, you know, their rituals, their festivals, their temples, completely different. You'd walk through the woods and see, or the jungle rather, and see like tombs built into the mountain side and stuff. And so it was, I mean, it was a really fascinating experience. Yeah, that's great. And I think. That's a unique part of the military life is you get to go and experience all these different cultures when you, you travel overseas like that, whether it's to Japan or Korea or Germany or, you know, other places around the world that we station troops, you know, it's just really interesting that you get that experience. And a lot of the civilian counterparts, you know, the nine-year-old kids in America, just, they don't just get that kind of experience unless they were fortunate enough to travel someplace on a vacation, but they usually don't go and live someplace else and experience a culture for an extended period of time like that. Yeah. Um, so let's fast forward a bit. So after you get out of the military and you're, you talked about how, you know, you got into yoga, you got into the corporate America, and then you got back into writing. What was that transition all like for you? Did you have a game plan coming out of the military or you sort of wing it as you're coming out? What was that all it's, like for you? Yeah. So not having a frame of reference of what something outside the military looked like. And I just, I, it's it, even just reflecting on the, what you just asked the question, I, I don't, I didn't have a game plan. I knew salary wise, what I hoped to make. And I didn't like, I didn't, again, it was kind of like I was in, so I had started out in artillery and I moved to communications around the, the time the Marine Corps is merging single channel with digital. And so I felt like it was a place that I could play in. But I had, I only applied to like three places to work. I applied to a defense contractor outside Quantico. I deploy, I applied to Cisco systems, the, the IT giant. And then one, I had gone to a special school and had, I got a bachelor's degree, but it was also like a very specific school on kind of the art of war fighting that the Marine Corps did the school of advanced war fighting. And one of the alums had gotten out and had started a security firm in the Middle East out of UAE. I want to say Bahrain. And so I applied there because I was like, I could be like a mercenary. And it sounded like this romantic swashbuckly kind of thing, which, right. okay. And then I, as I kind of looked at my uh, options, I knew the swashbuckly thing was, it certainly could be cool. I and mean, that would be like cutting edge stuff potentially, but also I would never have a normal life. Like I would just, that's saying, that's committing yourself to a lifestyle that you're don't necessarily come back from the defense contractor. It was someone that I had worked with previously. And so I thought that could be a good option, 
but I also kind of wanted to, I want, like, I wanted to do something different. Like I wanted to like challenge myself. And so Cisco, we worked with Cisco to an extent in IT and comms in the Marines, but not obviously like not the company itself and to step into that world, I thought would be really compelling. So my resume got passed on from someone I went to school with at Penn state, the hiring manager that I spoke with was a former Marine too, or Marine. So we clicked on that space and he was like, I want you to come in and manage our Navy accounts, you know, from a post sales perspective. And I was like, okay, whatever that means, post sales, I'll figure that out. But so I did, and it was honestly, Scott, for me, again, even though I wasn't on active duty, the first 18 years of my life or 20 years of my life or whatever, but I had that military mindset. I like, I lived in the military for that time. And so getting out, I was like, for the first five or six years, I compared every week, I compared what happened that week in corporate America to what my experience was in the military. Cause it was just, I was the only frame of reference I had. And so it was, in some ways it was very cool. In some ways I wanted to really focus on what it meant to be in a place where you didn't like, it, it, I mean, it was just such a fascinating transition. You asked specifically, I'll give you some examples. Like in the Marine, in the Marines, you don't really have boundaries. Like anything is, you can discuss anything virtually with anybody. Like it, it's just, especially if you're deployed, like there's no old barred. So I'd been at Cisco three months and had gone to lunch with some, I was a manager. I'd gone to lunch with some of the engineers who were employees who reported to me and then some who were just on our team. And we're walking back into the building and the guy I was talking to, I'm like, man, I got to take a, and I set a colorful way for having to go to the bathroom. And he looks at me in disgust. He's like, keep it to yourself. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you don't talk about that. Oh my gosh. Like you guys have boundaries, like, whoa. And it was this big revelation. And so in some ways I was like, I have to be really careful what I say. Like, you can't just be like, oh, this is whatever. And, and so that was kind of that, that pumped my brakes a little bit, but it also made me appreciate that people, the biggest piece that I came to realize about the transition was in a lot of ways, the military people are the last thing you're focused on is yourself in many ways. Like the last, the absolute last, you're not talking about designing or shaping your life. You're doing your career and going where the needs of Marine Corps or military send you. And in the civilian world, it is completely different. People have like, this is my thing, this is what I'm doing. I don't care about you, I don't care what you're doing. And it was just this fascinating shift. And in some ways that was as radical a shift as yoga was, that was also the pathway for helping me kind of connect myself to something outside the military, because obviously being exposed to philosophy, you know, Eastern culture in Japan, I took away some semblance of like a meditation practice or meditating when I was really young. Wasn't great at it, but that was part of what looked, what led me into yoga. But then really it was understanding what it means to be successful in the job that I was in and how to interact with people in a way to respect and appreciate that they had boundaries in terms of how they want to be interacted with. Right. Which again, in the military, you don't really have to worry about. And that took time. I mean, that just, that took a lot of time for me. Yeah. That is something that it's actually interesting when you said those boundaries, I thought to myself, okay, I think I know where he's going with this because just the way you talk to people in the military is totally different. And those boundaries don't exist the way they do in the civilian world. You, yeah. you can literally talk about just about anything and people will laugh it off. People, you know, they, it'll, it hits, resonates differently with people in the military than it does outside in the civilian world. And, yeah. you know, I found myself too, just biting my tongue sometimes. Like, I know I want to say this, but if I do, everyone in the room is going to be looking at me like I got three heads because this, this oh, yeah. is not going to fly right. So, oh yeah. Uh, so that was a big thing. I think for a lot of people coming out of the military, it's like, how do I even talk to these people? It's like, I'm on a foreign land trying to learn new cultures, customs it, and it is. things like and, that, you know? And especially in, you know, what's, and, and that's the, what's made having been Cisco so fascinating. Cisco is a global company. And yeah. part of the realization of the company is the internet in particular, since that's where what they do is about and for everyone. It's not about certain people with certain beliefs and it's really, it opens up the company in a lot of ways. And that makes you appreciate that everyone wants to be treated as an individual. 
and certainly in the military where individual identity succumbs to the organizational identity to a great extent, that is a huge transition to make because again, like you said, in the military, I mean, I remember used to like, I mean, we just joke unabashedly and nothing, like nothing was really off limits and it wasn't insensitive because anything was game and like, it didn't matter if you were an officer or enlisted, if you were going to participate, it was a brotherhood or a sisterhood and to get out and you say, it's not that way, but that's the great thing about being a civilian or being in civilian world is it's not supposed to be that way. Like the whole purpose of the military is to afford people the luxury of being able to create their own life on their terms. And even that was for me, the biggest adjustment to make was certainly growing up in the military and feeling like I didn't have a choice in where we lived and obviously no kid really does. And then deciding that's what I'm going to do for an occupation for a while was a great way to realize that, oh, well, like this is what I thought I'm supposed to do. And then finally I got this point where like, wait, I can do something else. And when you get out, you realize, oh, I can do anything I set my mind to as long as they have a plan and the tenacity to see it through. That is a completely, like in, in some ways, the resiliency that you find in the Marine Corps is a tool or the military is a tool that you can use to say, okay, let me start to get really clear on the future that I want to create for myself and my family. And that, at least for me, that took some practice and time to figure out how to do that really well. Yeah. And when you talk about like getting out of the military and saying you could do anything that you put your mind to and put the effort in for, that's a big thing. You could do anything yeah. <laughs> like that. You could be a politician. You could be a doctor. You could be a janitor. You could be like, there's some choices you got to make oh, with, yeah. with your life as you're coming out. Right. You, you could be a filmmaker. Anything. I mean, you, you could, could do. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's not, it's a little overwhelming, but at first it's right. like, for, for me, it's just first, okay. What are the rules of the game here? Cause it's obviously different than what I was doing for the you know last part of my life. And that takes time to figure out. It does. And thankfully, I, at least now, I feel like there's a lot a greater abundance of veteran friend, friendly communities in a lot of companies and stuff, because yeah. it's essential to help. And that has certainly helped me. Like, how do you, uh, like, I remember talking to vets about how you talk to other people. How do you talk to women? Because I didn't spend a great <laughs> deal of time in the room around women. Like certainly not the first, you know, five or seven years when I was in combat arms. And all those things require practice and familiarity. And then when you kind of say, okay. I get it. Then it's like, oh, wait a minute. I can, like, I have a lot of control. Like I have an incredible amount of control. And that's what, you know, especially in this day and age where technology has transformed and evolved the way it has, there's this rise of the entrepreneurial spirit within the United States. Now, certainly we've seen that in recent years, like Amazon has basically shut, shuttered the mall industry. Etsy is this unique home for unique things that people come up with their own and it's fascinating. It's like, okay, what do I want to do in the next phase? How do I make a big impact to society and contribute? So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, did you have any doubts about yourself and like where you're going as you were making this transition? And if you did, like, what were you doing to overcome those doubts and that, that stuff that you were, you had talking to yourself in the back of your head, like, can I actually do this? You know? Yeah. Well, I, the best example is probably my writing because. The reason I gave up on writing the one, the reason I gave up on writing when I joined the Marines was because I needed to figure out what does it mean to be a Marine? Like, how do I lead Marines? And then going into Somalian operation, restore hope, like writing isn't something that's top of mind for you. Like you're just, it's not in the brain. But then in around 2000, I got inspired. I had a boss, it was a full bird colonel, but had been a Boston police officer. Well, it's now military police by battalion commander and he painted. Like he had paintings that he had done in his office and I was blown away. I was like, whoa, because you just don't, you do not, I love my fellow Marines, all of them. I have never seen that kind of artistry in the Marine Corps. Like I just, I did not see it. And so we connected like best boss I ever worked for in the military, certainly brought the best out of me. And I started writing poetry again. Also like I, there was a, I was taking a, pursuing a master's in psychology and there was a woman in one of my classes who shared a really poignant story. and. She kind of became my muse and I got inspired to write poetry again. And, and even that, but even that, like, I'll just share candidly that like, when fellow officers found out I wrote poetry, their first question was, are you gay? And I was like, 
what? You haven't even read my poetry. Like you don't even know, like I wrote about Achilles and it is not a good poem. Like it's not a happy poem, but that was kind of the mindset that people had. And so like, there's not something that I promoted actively like, Hey, come read my poetry. It's just like, it was this weird thing. So when I got out and finally, even though I was traveling a lot for work, I was stationed, like I, I came home to the same place and so much of my life, literally for the first 36 years or so had been measured by how much time I had left at the place I was. And I made base, I made decisions on relationships. I made decisions on like what I was going to do, like in the time I was there, I just made those decisions. And now that stop gap wasn't two years out or three years out. I could potentially stay in one place for as long as I wanted. That was fascinating to me. And that opened up the door for me that I could start writing again. And so probably about two years after I got out, I was selling off in the corporate world. I was teaching yoga and I'm like, okay, I'm ready to start writing my first book. And I wanted to write horror stories. I loved Stephen King growing up. I love Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And so I kind of wanted to be the next Stephen King. So I had an idea because I'd lived in this place at the same time and it wasn't going anywhere. I just had a feel for the town I was in. And I wrote about 110 pages over, I don't know, a couple months and it wasn't great, but I just couldn't make it go any further. And so I got really dejected and finally I found an excuse to stop writing and then let it go. Probably about a year later, year and a half later, same thing happened new inspiration, new story. And, uh, it, same thing happened 110, 120 pages. I couldn't develop the characters further. And I was just so frustrated. I couldn't understand it. And at some point, like I was having success in work and I felt that was good. Yoga was, I was still learning what it meant to really what yoga was about and what it meant to be an instructor. And, but the, like the writing thing was calling to me. So it went on for 11 years. 11 years, I tried to write my first book from 2006 to 2017. And I'd gone through a marriage during that time. I got into a relationship and it just so happened, like my last attempt to write a book in Hell Horror Story had been in 2016. And it was the best idea I had. It was a really cool, like end of days, apocalyptic sort of thing. I mean, just really powerful, but same thing happened, 120 pages or so. And then for Christmas, someone gave me a whiskey and yoga t-shirt because I was a big scotch drinker at the time. And obviously with yoga and just the irony of it all. And then I started re reading Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. And that book transformed my life. Uh, I read the first or second chapter and in the chapter, one of the chapters he talks about, what is your purpose in life? And Scott, I was blown away because the idea that my life had purpose was fascinating. Like I just, it was this huge wake up call. And so I did, I had tremendous doubts up until that point. And I was so exasperated because I knew that writing was a passion that was calling to me, that it called to me in my entire life. I postponed it when I was in the Marines and now I wanted to reinvigorate it. And initially the angle was, I would write stories that would scare people. When I read Napoleon Hill's Think Real Rich, and it became about how do I contribute to other people and how do I like, how can I help them find their purpose in life? I got so excited. I wrote a life purpose statement. And then I stood on writing my first book and six months later I wrote it. So tremendous doubt and certainly tremendous doubt in the corporate world too. For a while I thought about, should I join the reserves? Do I like, I do still want to do that. And I had a boss who was like, you make just as much money if you don't do that. And in some ways he was right. But in some ways I was like, you know what? I been, I, I mean, I was just tired of the military. Like and I, I love the service. I love what it did for me, everything, the opportunities I had to do. But after 30 something years, I was like, okay, it's enough. So absolutely full of doubt because it's just, it's, you know, doubt is you, you kind of have to turn into your doubt and face it because it's just windling away at helping you. It's helping you understand who you are supposed to be and who you're not missing, supposed to be kind of so. Yeah. It's great how you kept coming back to the writing and didn't give up after that first, you know, a few yeah. times that you're writing and then it seemed like you hit that, that roadblock and you couldn't keep going. You kept trying, yep. try something else. Okay, fine. This story, maybe this story wasn't the one it's not, that one's not working, but try something else and you start new and okay, fine. That one's not it either, but you kept going and you kept going. And eventually you got to the point where you're doing the thing that you wanted to do in the first place, writing. And, and I want to be 
sure that we leave some time to talk about these books too, because that to me is an important part of this whole thing is the end result. You know, you just talked about how much of a struggle it was for you to keep going and push through and overcome that doubt and figure out what your purpose was, what that was. And you ended up with a couple books and you're still writing at this point. And that's, that's amazing that you've gotten through all of the obstacles that you had in your way and you kept pushing through and here you are now with something to show for it, for all of that hard work. And during that time, I'm sure it must've been a struggle to be going through all of that and thinking to yourself, maybe I just don't have what it takes to be a writer or whatever. And absolutely. No, I honestly, it was first, I didn't have a good writing practice. What I mean by that is, you know, we live in this day and age where the internet provides us such instant gratification all the time. And I felt like if I was taking the time to write that what I was writing must be perfect. That was kind of my mindset going in. And I labored, like it took, I would like write, but I wanted everything to be perfect. So like I would spend what felt like probably minutes trying to get the right sentence and then the next sentence. And it was just like, it wasn't flowing and I didn't appreciate it. I didn't, and I didn't write just for the sake of writing. I didn't write to like make it organic. And so it was incredibly frustrating. And then when I made this shift to be like, okay, I'm not going to be a horror writer. I'm now going to write self-help. It was different because now it's about, all right, I'm going to share my personal experiences and how I grew from those things. And that was a little bit exasperating, but at the same time, it was scratch that itch. Like you have wanted to be a writer your whole life. Is it important for you to be a horror writer or is it important for you to write and get a message out there and contribute? And that was a big shift. And even writing whiskey and yoga, my first book. That was like every day I sat down to write, it was a struggle because it was like, can I do this? I've been trying for 11 years to write a book. I haven't, can I finish like, and I remember even like how I set the book up. I was just like, let me get to 150 pages. Just let me get to 150 pages of the thing, which is like a silly way to write, but I did like, I got, I don't remember what it ended up being, but I did. And, and that was this great relief. And the book went to number one on Amazon. It was huge, but it also opened up. I, like, I remember I did a big book launch to help support it. And a week after the launch, someone who helped me with the launch, who's had some ex success already said, well, okay, what's next? What's your, like, what's your platform? What are you going to talk about? And I'm like, oh, I have to have a platform. I thought my book was just going to change the world. I didn't know I had to do something else. And so it kind of started pulling on this thread, but again, that's the magic of really getting clear on what you want. And for me, it was. Writing became not an obsession, but I kind of started to understand the process of writing. And that's why, yeah. you know, a lot of people think that, or a lot of people say that public speaking is the scariest thing in, in the world. I would contend for most people, it's private speaking. It's how you talk to yourself because invariably, if you journal or if you start writing a story, you are having a conversation with yourself in some way. And for a lot of people, that is too terrifying a concept to grasp but we can all do it. Like we can all have that conversation. And so certainly my writing process has shifted since then. I write just almost every day and it's very organic and it's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. And we all do do that, whether we're writing a book or not, we all do have those conversations with ourselves. We talk to ourselves and, you know, just that, that little voice that's in the back of your head, that's telling you, yeah, that, that's a good idea to go do this or yeah. uh, don't do that or, you know, Oh man, that was stupid that you did this or <laughs> man, you should really feel good about that other thing that you did. Right. And so you, we all have that voice and you're right when you're, especially when you're writing about your own personal experiences and story. And I did that with my book as well. It's kind of like you're having that conversation with yourself or oh, yeah. uh, in a weird way, it was like, I was having conversations with people who I was writing about in the book, but I was yeah. having that conversation in my head. Yeah. What would so-and-so say if. I said this, and you know, what was that conversation like? And it was, it's just a strange process, but you know, I'm glad that you found the thing that you wanted to get out there to yep. benefit the world. Not to say being a, a fiction writer, a, a horror writer or something like that wouldn't be impactful. Obviously people like Stephen King and other yep. writers in that genre, they have had their impact on society. Um, and. People need those kind of books too. And those are great, but it just didn't seem like it was flowing for you. So, you know, pivot and just change directions. And 
you're still writing, you, like you said, you write every day and you're still doing this. It's a thing that you're passionate about and that you love doing. And here you are and doing it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the books that you have? So whiskey and yoga, you mentioned is one of them. And then the lighthouse keeper is the other one, if I'm not mistaken. And tell us about those books and what they're all about. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Scott. So whiskey and yoga again was really kind of a lifetime journey to publishing my first book, but it's a very simple book. It's a weekend read, really. It's a quick read, but the book is about finding your purpose in life and how all of us have a magnetic north that we are guided to. And it's not a job. It's not a specific function. It's something deeper that guides us to have a fulfilling life while doing tremendous achievements and accomplishments to help other people, to serve other people. And it's really just a series of most of vignettes on kind of experiences I had and what led me to find my purpose and how people can find their purpose too. And a lot of it is simple as just writing the question down. What is my purpose in life? Because if you write that question down, physically do it in the act of writing, not necessarily on a computer, but in the act of pen and paper, your mind will come up with an answer. And, you know, I wrote my first one in 2017. I rewrote it later that year when I went to a Tony Robbins event. And then I rewrote it again this past December at a previous Tony, another Tony Robbins event. And so Whiskey and Yogi gave birth to the Lighthouse Keeper. And it was, the Lighthouse Keeper was two, two little sections in Whiskey and Yoga. And it was really born out of my experience of being a yoga instructor. And part of what drew me to yoga, and it's probably a good place to talk about this, is when I got my last assignment in the Marines working in Southern Command out of Miami. And so I spent a lot of time in Central America. And this was, like I said, mid, mid two thousands, but I would like on average, I would get like 50 email a week. I mean, just, I wasn't spending a lot of time on the computer, especially if I was in Honduras or Panama or someplace. And then when I got to Cisco, I would get 50 email, like in two hours. And it was. It was, I mean, it was nuts, like the volume of email and just like, how do I manage this thing called an inbox? Like, what is this? And I would leave work and my mind between the radio being on, I would have, my mind would just be this congested freeway of traffic, it would be to-do lists. It would be reminders. It would be meetings that I had to have. It would be people I was meeting with and how I was going to like deal with that meeting. And it was just all this stuff. And what I found really quickly, probably after my second or third class to do yoga was when I got onto a yoga mat, all that noise went away. And it was like, whoa, what is this? Like, it's quiet in my head. I can focus like my attention on stuff. And that was a really cool experience. And so that was certainly for the first few years as an instructor, that was really what I focused on was what's the relationship between you and what you observe, because how you observe something is almost important as what you're observing, where you're putting your attention. And two, two people can look at something and have completely different experiences. I can look at a vase of roses and say, oh my God, that's so beautiful. And someone else can look at it and say, it makes them think of a funeral they just attended. So it's two completely experiences. So the lighthouse keeper was really this idea that our mind is an ocean and that's where all your memories are. Everybody you've ever met is in this ocean. And then your lighthouse, the lighthouse is where you put your awareness. So this idea that most of us develop patterns and routines in our life. So day after day, especially if you work the same job for an extended period of time, your lighthouse just goes in the same pattern. Well, the premise behind lighthouse keeper is with focus, with meditation, with willpower, and it's kind of a direction on where you want to take your life, who you want to become in the future version of yourself. You can start to direct your awareness to go where you want it to go in the lighthouse instead of reacting to this pattern that you've created. And it's a larger metaphor for life, obviously, that's what we focus on would bring more into our life. And so the key is then to focus on things that we want as opposed to things that we don't want so that we can bring the things we want more into our life. I think both of those sound like they have some pretty incredible messages there that analogy or that the visual of having the, your, your life being that ocean and yep. every experience, every person, every, everything that you've experienced in that life is in that ocean. And then, you know, was drawing you, you know, towards the lighthouse and everything. I think all of that just seems like it has a lot of good stuff in there. So definitely want people to go check out those books. Where can people go to find your books? 
And thank you. So they're both available on Amazon. So you can find them on Amazon, Whiskey and Yoga and The Lighthouse Keeper. Or you can go to davidrichardsauthor.com, my website, and they're both available there as well. So I'd encourage you to check them out. I'm, I'm really looking forward to releasing my next book in December, but The Lighthouse Keeper is a great read. It's fun. I just had someone who gave me some nice comments about it the other day, but it's that was fun for me because it, became, it was a fiction book. And that was finally like I got to write a fiction book. It was still self-help, obviously, with what I just shared. Sure. But the fact that I could make a story out of it was pretty exciting to me. Yeah, absolutely. And it got you into that fiction world as well. It did. You were, it did. You were trying to get into. And so that's good. It's uh, maybe wasn't the horror that you're looking for necessarily, but it's still a step in the right direction to, to get there. And who knows, maybe one of these days you'll have a, a horror book in you and that will come out as well. I did, but there, there are some spooky spots in the lighthouse keeper. I will say there's some, the first night in the lighthouse is a little claustrophobic and the storm comes in. So it's pretty cool, but yeah. it's not, it's not Stephen King quality yet. So, <laughs> well, you know, honestly, when you mentioned the lighthouse, and I started thinking of the old, uh, Scooby-Doo episodes and thinking of them like walking through and, and you know, finding the ghost or something like that I, in there. And, I, and so, <laughs> so, so it, it kind of had that, uh, spookiness to it as well. Probably not exactly what you were going for, but that's, that was the first thought that popped I'll take it, there. Scott. I'll take it. If it's a Scooby-Doo, <laughs> much props to Scoob. So I'll take it. <laughs> Awesome. So I will have links to your website and to your books in the show notes. So anyone who wants to take a look at the books and pick up a copy, definitely check out the show notes and you'll find all the links to them there. David, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. I really do appreciate you taking the time to come on the show, sharing your experience, your transition out of the military and how you got to where you are now as a writer and following that passion and overcoming all those doubts that you had about your yourself along the way. I think it's inspiring. And I hope other people will take a page out of your playbook and apply that to their lives as well. Scott, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm looking forward to promoting this with my audience and uh, so grateful for what you're doing. Thanks for listening to the drive on podcast. If you want to check out more episodes or learn more about the show, you can visit our website, driveonpodcast.com. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Drive On Podcast.